permission to speak. Um, um, and um, let me begin right away with uh, defining what it is uh, the main object of study. So what, what are these classified spaces? So um, I'll be focusing on finite CW complexes um, and I will look at the uh, topological monoid of self homotopy equivalences from X to itself. This is a group like topological monoid and it has a classifying space and that classifying space uh, classifies vibrations with uh, fiber X. So here, you know, if you have a, some CW complex B say, then you look at homotopy classes of maps from that to the classifying space of this monoid that's in bijection with equivalence classes of vibrations over that space B where the fiber is homotopy equivalent to X. So this is very classical uh, homotopy theory. Um, and um, this means that um, the cohomology ring of this classifying space may be identified with the ring of characteristic clauses of vibrations with fiber X. <clears throat> and the main problem that I want to address today is uh, the problem of computing this cohomology ring. So this ring of characteristic clauses of vibrations with fiber X. Now, there, this is, sort of, I, I think, of intrinsic interest, but there are also other uh, things that may make you interested in this. So personally, um, the, I got into this because I was considering questions about, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the corresponding question in the smooth category. I mean, try to understand characteristic clauses of smooth fiber bundles with fibers on some compact manifold. And uh, so, um, and you can think of this as a homotopical approximation to the cohomology of the diffeomorphism group. So this was my original motivation for go get, getting into this, but this will not be so, uh, I mean, this will not be featured in this talk so much, but this was my original motivation. Um, as we'll see today though, I mean, there's an interesting connections to the cohomology of arithmetic groups, um, especially when you study this for uh, simply connected CW complexes X. And, um, in earlier work that I did with Yves Madsen, we discovered a curious and to us surprising connection to uh, certain graph complexes in the sense of Konsevich. And I will touch upon this a little, I mean, towards the end of the talk. So these are some reasons why I am interested in this space, um, apart from the intrinsic interest in, in understanding characteristic clauses of vibrations. So uh, let's try to review some, sorry, was there a question? I hope you, okay. So let's review some of the classical sort of results about this space. Uh, so first of all, uh, the fundamental group um, of this classifying space may be identified with the group of homotopy classes of self equivalences. Uh, this is also, you know, pi zero of the automorphism monoid. Um, and there are some very uh, interesting general results about this group, at least when X is simply connected. And this goes back to Sullivan and Wilkerson. Uh, these are results from the 1970s or so. And it's, I think we, uh, you could say this is one of the sort of, maybe one of the first uh, sort of big applications of rational homotopy theory in the sense of Sullivan. Um, so if X is a simply connected finite CW complex, then uh, if you look at uh, the group of self homotopy equivalences of the rationalization of X. So, I mean, every simply connected space admits a rationalization, uh, which on the, on the level of homotopy groups has the effect of tensoring everything with Q. And well, that's a space in its own right. And you can look at its homotopy equivalences and that turns out to be a linear algebraic group to find over Q. So that's a very you know, severe restriction on this group, you could say. And, and moreover, you can relate um, the equivalences of X to this group. Uh, namely, I mean, rationalization is a functor, um, at least on the homotopy category. So this induces a homomorphism from self equivalences of X to self equivalences of the rationalization. And this group homomorphism uh, has finite kernel and the image is an arithmetic subgroup of this linear algebraic group. So let me remind you what, what these things uh, mean, um, okay? And then this puts very severe restrictions on this group. I mean, for instance, this implies that this E of X is finitely uh, generated and, and, and so on, and even finitely presented. 
Um, so yeah, for a reminder, so a linear algebraic group uh, is roughly speaking, you know, some some sub some matrix group cut out by polynomial equations. So you start with some you know um, GLN, and then you look at certain polynomials uh, in the uh, in the entries of the matrices, and then you look at the zero sets of a, of a bunch of such polynomials. And these polynomials are supposed to have rational coefficients. Uh, and then if, if, if what you get is a, is a group, then that's a linear algebraic group. Or more precisely, uh, more formally, um, this thing is a, the rational points of an affine algebraic group scheme defined over Q. That's, I guess, a, a more precise way of saying it. Um, yes. Uh, and arithmetic subgroups of linear algebraic groups are defined by the following. So um, you, uh, Essentially, you would like to take the integer points, but th this integer points might depend on how you embedded the group as a linear algebraic subgroup of some GLN. So different embeddings might give you different Z points, but the commensurability clause uh, um, is, is well defined. So, um, and that means, you know, if you, so you're led to this definition that a subgroup is arithmetic if the intersection of gamma with the Z points in G, where you have realized G as, as, a, as a subgroup of GLN in some way, um, that intersection should have finite index both in gamma and in GZ. But morally, you should sort of, I mean, you, you can think of this, this wants to be the Z points in some sense of the, of the, of the group. Okay. And just an elementary example, um, if we take a wedge of spheres, this, the following section exercise in Hatcher's algebraic topology book. So uh, if they is greater than one, then the group of self equivalences of a wedge is just isomorphic to GLNZ. And an isomorphism is given, for instance, by looking at uh, the, the representation in, in um, integer homology. And similarly, the automorphisms of the rationalization is just GLNQ. And, uh, and, and here, we, it, it's, it's very, you know, you manifestly see the inclusion of the integer points into the Q points here. Um, and here it's also clear why simple connectivity is necessary because if D is equal to one, you get a, you know, a, a bouquet of circles. And then that's of course a classifying space for the free group uh, Fn um, on N generators. And it's the group of self equivalences of uh, uh, the classifying space of a free group is the outer automorphism group of that free group. And that's known to, to be not arithmetic at least if N is um, greater than two. Um, it is actually finitely, excuse me, finitely generated, but there are examples of non-simply connected spaces for which E of X is not even finitely generated. Uh, okay, uh, good. So um, I don't know any questions so far. Um, I I do have a question. That's okay. Um, yeah. I'm wondering. So I actually have never taken a topology course, but I I'm curious. So I, I showed up here. And the second definition that you have here, when you say the uh, intersection of gamma and um, the group over the integers, what does it mean to have a finite index? Is that the same as? It's just like, the, the index in that I know is like the number of left cosets. Yes, but is yes, that the same yes. thing? It's the classical thing for just an abstract okay. group and inclusion of one abstract group into another. You look at the cardinality of the coset. Yeah, I mean, the Thank set you. of cosets. Yeah, so it's very classical. Alexander, on the previous slide, did you ex assume uh, simple connectivity of the space? No, but but I mean the previous slide was just motivation. So so oh so uh, sorry for the previous slide. The previous slide was this, yeah. and here you really need oh yeah simple connectors yeah exactly this, this and this is what's the point I was trying yeah. to make here with the last but you really uh -huh. need this exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so we have some understanding then of, of E of X. I mean, it's this arithmetic group, so that's great. Uh, so what about, so that, then we understand the fundamental group of this classifying space. And so now what can we say about the universal cover? Uh, there are some classical results from rational homotopy theory. And this also goes back to Sullivan, and Schlesinger, Stashev, and Town Ray. So if you look at the universal cover, uh, this is my notation for the universal cover. Uh, the one here signifies the subgroup of the fundamental group that corresponds to the cover. So in this case, it's the trivial group. Uh, the universal cover is, turns out to be rationally equivalent to the nerve of a certain differential graded Lie algebra, namely the, the, the DG Lie algebra of derivations on the minimal Sullivan model for the space X. 
So the minimal Sullivan model is a certain differential graded algebra, which is uh, a commutative uh, uh, version of the code chains, you could say, uh, with rational coefficients on the space X. And, um, and then you can form its Lie algebra of derivations. And this little one here signifies that I take the positive truncation of this DG Lie algebra. This is, corresponds exactly to taking the universal cover here. And uh, I, I, you know, in, in it, I will not go into basic rational homotopy theory, but let, so let me just, if, if so, if you don't know what this exactly means, let me just state some consequences of this. Um, so the main consequences of having a, a DG Lee model like this is that you can compute the rational homotopy groups of the space algebraically in terms of this DG Lee algebra. I mean, a DG Lee algebra is in particular a chain complex. And the homology groups of this chain complex now gives you the rational homotopy groups of this classifying space. And, and then similarly, I mean, a, a DG Lee algebra, you can form a Chevalier Eilenberg type cohomology of, of a DG Lee algebra. And that turns out to compute the, the cohomology of the space of which the DG Lee algebra is a model. So these are the main consequences of having uh, of, the, of the theorem. Okay. Um, so this gives you some algebraic model. Um, for the universal cover of of, the, of the, this classifying space, and I should say uh, there you, you can say things about uh, I mean about the, the fundamental group as well. I mean uh, using this this DG Lee algebra. That's a more recent result of, of Block and Lazarev. That if you look at the zero homology of this derivation Lie algebra then that turns out to be equal to or isomorphic to the Lie algebra of this algebraic group that we talked about uh, in the last slide. So, you, so, so, so this DG Lie algebra knows some things about this algebraic group, but as you know, probably, I mean, you can't recover a general algebraic group from its Lie algebra. So we have really lost some information by going to this derivation DG Lie algebra, okay? Uh, so, so now the problem is to try to construct, um, I mean, so those are classical results. And I mean, going back to the seventies and eighties and um, the problem which, which uh, was raised, I mean, already, I mean, a long time ago is, is can we find an algebraic model for the whole space? Not just for, you know, not, not just say something about the fundamental group and about the universal cover. So, so let me, Say it like this. I mean, so uh, as, as we saw, the classical results, they give information about the base and the fiber in the following homotopy fiber sequence. So here we have the classifying space of the group of self equivalences. I mean, this discrete group. Here we have the classifying space of the, uh, or excuse me, here we have the universal cover. So this is just a um, 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 universal cover sort of vibration that you have for any space. And we know something about the base here and, and, and about the fiber. But could the question is whether we can assemble that to some global information about the total space. So the classical results do not yield that. They do not yield an algebraic model for the space. And for instance, that we, we don't they give, give essentially zero information about the differentials in the spectral sequence um, of this vibration. And that's the kind of thing we, we would like to have. Um, uh, but to address this, uh, I mean, one needs to incorporate the, the action of this, you know, as, as usual, when you have a universal cover, I mean, the transformation group, in this case, EX acts on the universal cover, and we would need to incorporate that action in some way into these algebraic models. So that is something that wasn't addressed, uh, I mean, really in the classical literature. And that's, and this is just the thing we, you know, we want to, we want to do today. So. Um, and so let me give you the first results that we have in this direction. Um, and this could be viewed as an extension of the Sullivan-Wilkerson theorem to higher homotopy groups and to cohomology groups. So the Sullivan-Wilkerson theorem was the statement that, the, I mean, about uh, that you get this pi one is, is this, you know, arithmetic subgroup of a linear algebraic group. And here we have some similar algebraicity statements of the higher homotopy groups. And it goes as follows. So, if you look at the, I mean, the representations of the transformation group EX in the rational homotopy and cohomology of the universal cover, they are algebraic representations in the sense that uh, they are restrictions of, I mean, rational representations or algebraic representations of this linear algebraic group. 
And that's much better than just having representations of this abstract group. I mean, I mean, rational representations, you know, are defined in terms of, uh, I mean, the, 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 all the maps involved when defining representations are supposed to be in the category of, of, of schemes. So, or, or more, more uh, basically, I mean, the action maps are given by uh, regular functions or, or polynomial functions. So this gives you some 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 further structure or some further qualitative properties of these these homotopy groups. Um, okay, so that's great, but uh, this is not quite enough um, because we ultimately want chain level a chain level model and or a chain level understanding of this holonomy action. This you know, I mean this theorem only tells us something about the action on on homotopy and cohomology, but we want something on the model on the chain level. Uh, and the problem is that there's a you know there's an in, there's an intrinsic hurdle here. It's actually provably impossible to have that the action of ex on the cohomology here lifts to an action on the dg Lee algebra. So that's impossible to do in general. Um, so you have to come up with something else if you if you want to address this. All right. So uh, what we do is we give ourselves some more room. So we study, uh, instead of studying the universal cover, we study other covers as well. So we study certain you know, covers, uh, so it says now to, to, to normal subgroups. And we study the associated homotopy fiber sequence. I mean, when U is the trivial group, we, we get back the thing we had before. Uh, and we can generalize the previous result. I mean, this algebraic results as follows. So um, if you, this subgroup acts unipotently on the rational homology of the space, uh, then we can prove, first of all, that the associated cover is actually a virtual nilpotent space. So that means in particular that, um, so nilpotent uh, is maybe familiar. I mean, it, nilpotent means that the fundamental group is a nilpotent group and it acts nilpotently on the higher homotopy groups. Virtual nilpotent means that, you know, there's a finite index subgroup that achieves those things. Um, uh, but, but, but it's, it's, I mean, yeah, but you, you, from the point of view of rational homotopy theory, virtual nilpotent is as good as nilpotent. Um, and, and I mean, for, for, for the trivial group, you, you with the trivial group, this is the universal cover is of course simply connected. So that's, that's even, even better, but, but we retain, you know, uh, something when we pass to uh, unipotent actions. And then we have an algebraic result for the action of the, you know, this is now the transformation group and it acts on the cover and, and this action is algebraic in a suitable sense as well, okay. And I should remark here that this first statement is actually goes back to, a, to an old result of Dror and Zabrodsky. Uh, they proved nilpotence, uh, I mean, when you act instead, you know, on, on, on um, integral homology. So if you have nilpotent action on integral homology, then you can drop the virtual here. Um, I should also say that this space also admits a tractable DG Lee model. And this is more recent. I mean, this is this was proved by Felix Fuentes and Murillo last year. And we also give an independent proof for that, that in our paper. Or I should, maybe I didn't say that. This is all joint work with the postdoc at Stockholm University, Tom Zeman. Um, so we, we do have retractable Lee models for these spaces, but it's still without any action of the transformation group. And that's really what, what we want today. So. So we have to do some more work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah. So the result of this, uh, the result of this theorem is applicable to the case when you is trivial group. Uh, uh, yes, and then I mean this subsumes the theorem I stated earlier. But then what's the point of considering this? And it will come in the next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, so, if we, the point is that if we choose U to be as big as possible, then something really wonderful happens. Um, so, uh, we can show that there exists uh, one of these groups, U, that act unipotently on the rational homology, such that uh, if we look at the associated quotient on the level of rationalizations, 
this is a reductive algebraic group. Um, and um, yeah, maybe I'll get back to what reductive means for those who don't know that, uh, but, but it's, a, it's a nice algebraic group. Uh, and the associated transformation group um, is, is an arithmetic subgroup of this reductive group. Um, and so far, this is not, not so, so, so different from the old stuff, but here's the really new stuff. So we can prove that there exists a nilpotent DGLE algebra in the category of algebraic representations of this reductive group. So we have a chain level, you know, some DGLE algebra with an action of this group, of, of this algebraic group. Uh, and such that this cover, you know, with this usual action of the transformation group is rationally equivalent to the nerve of this DG Lee algebra as, you know, it's equivalently with respect to this transformation group gamma X. So this is an equivariant rational model for this cover. And this is very special. I mean, most use that, you know, we talked about will not uh, have this property so there's a but there's a dis distinguished view that <laughs> that is better than all the all the rest okay and um this does yield an algebraic model for this the, the full classifying space because now we can just sort of play around with with you know um, equivalent homotopy theory and the right uh, the following rational equivalence so this classifying space is, is rational equivalent to here this is the nerve of this DGLE algebra and then it has an action of gamma, and here I take the homotopy orbit space, okay? And the rational equivalence, I mean, this space here, as I, uh, is, is, is not, uh, is far from nilpotent in general. So um, rational equivalence means rational homology equivalence, okay? Uh, now, uh, this also entails that you get the quasi isomorphic or commutative differential graded algebra. So the, the, the RAM algebra or the, the Sullivan's version of the Durham algebra with Q coefficients of the space can be expressed in terms of, um, you know, commutative coefficients on this uh, group with coefficients in the Chevalier Eilenberg coefficients of this DG Lee algebra. And so this completely reduces the study of this space. I mean, there was, excuse me, the study of the rational homotopy type of the, this classifying space to the study of the action of arithmetic groups on, on these, on these um, DG Lee algebras. <laughs> Um, so, yes, and um, even more is true. So the fact that we get a reductive group, so in characteristic zero, you can define reductive to mean uh, linearly redu reductive, which is to say that uh, the category of algebraic representations is semi-simple. All uh, all representations split as the direct sums um, of simple modules. So that's a characterizing property of reductive groups in characteristic zero. You can use that as a definition. Uh, and the fact that we get a reductive group is really wonderful because, you know, all the representations in this the Lee algebra now split. And these, with some extra work, has a very striking consequence, uh, namely that uh, you get an isomorphism of graded algebras um, I mean, the cohomology ring of this space is isomorphic to just the cohomology of gamma x with coefficients in chevalier algebra cohomology of the Lie algebra. And uh, this implies, but is actually stronger than collapse of the spectral sequence associated to the cover. So you remember that I complained earlier that when, when U was the trivial group and we looked at the corresponding vibration sequence for the universal cover, you know, the old results didn't get us information about the differentials in the spectral sequence. And now by passing to this other U, the spectral sequence just collapses. So you don't need to consider any differentials. You just have the, you know, the, you get an isomorphism like this. And it's an isomorphism of algebras. I mean, this is better than the collapse of the spectral sequence because a collapse of the spectral sequence would only give you an isomorphism after taking the associated graded with respect to certain filtration. So this is really, I, I mean, a, a remarkable sort of consequence. Um, and it, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Can I ask real quick, uh, Alexander? Um, so can, can you say why the semi-simplicity um, allows you to replace the, uh, the cotrans? Yeah, because every chain complex of semi-simple representations is split. It's chain homotopy equivalent to its own homology. So now you apply that observation to the co-chains on G, so the Chevalier-Eilenberg co-chains. So you can then 
write down a chain homotopy equivalence between that and the cohomology. So that immediately gives you the statement additively, yeah. and then you just check that the uh, that, oh, uh, then you have a spectral sequence which you've just shown collapse. No, you don't need a spectral sequence. That's the point. I mean, you, you just work on the coaching level. Uh, but I, uh, I guess maybe I was I was thinking to get the the ring structure. To get, um, no, you don't want to pass to the spectral sequence. Okay. You, you, you have to sort of uh, use homotopy transfer theorem for A infinity. I see. Okay. 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 Uh, so now, uh, so right, so this is, I, and in my mind, this is really the main result of our, I mean, the other results are, are, are more general, but this is the main outcome of our work, I would say. And I will want to spend the rest of the talk ex explaining how this plays out in examples, because we see some really interesting um, um, uh, cohomology groups appearing. Uh, so, but before that, I guess in my slides here, um, I, I wanted to give you a few words about the proof idea. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll um, in the interest of time, um, I'm, I noticed that I'm going slower than, than I expected. So, so in the interest of time, I will go through this uh, quickly. So I apologize you know, if it's too quick, but I, I, the main, I want to get to the examples. Um, so, so I will do the proof idea quickly. So the idea is that you use the Levy decomposition of algebraic groups. So for any algebraic group, uh, linear algebraic group over Q, you can decompose it as a semi-direct product of um, the, uh, the reductive part and a unipotent part. So uh, G sub U is the unipotent radical. It can be defined as the maximal normal unipotent subgroup. And then this is the quotient. And, and if this is uh, always going to be a reductive group uh, and there's a maximal reductive quotient associated to any uh, affine algebraic group. And so we just apply this basic piece of uh, algebraic group theory to uh, this linear algebraic group that uh, we're interested in. So we're going to this U Q that appeared earlier will be the unipotent radical. So it's really the maximal sort of U that you can you can pick here. Um, and this R of X will be the maximal reductive quotient of this algebraic group. And, and then um, uh, we let U, this, I mean, U that we talked about, this will just be the pre-image of this unipotent radical under the natural uh, homomorphism um, that we had before. So th th that gives you the definitions of these, these groups. Um, and let me say a little bit about how you get the action on the Lie algebra, because this is really the sort of the tricky, uh, I mean, the tricky part. So the key observations is that, well, th this is an out, of Sullivan's theory that uh, this uh, this group is isomorphic to automorphisms of the Sullivan model modulo the subgroup of those automorphisms that are homotopic to the identity. And now the whole problem that uh, I was complaining about earlier comes from this. This group does not act on the minimal Sullivan model. It only acts up to homotopy. So we seek, I mean, we really want to somehow rectify this action. Okay. And this is what passing to the reductive quotient achieves. So um, here's the diagram that that does the trick. So this reductive quotient is, by definition, uh, you know, uh, given by the reductive part of this this group. Now, a key fact is that this group H of automorphisms homotopic to the identity is a unipotent group, and that means that uh, uh, the automorphisms of lambda and this quotient will have the same maximal reductive quotient. So this is actually an isomorphism. And this allows us to rectify the action. Uh, and then we use the Levy decomposition. So this gives us an arrow in this, uh, you know, in, in the opposite direction here. And the composite arrow here gives us an action of Rx on the Sullivan model. And this is what makes everything tick. So now uh, this also acts on the DG Lee, maximal DG Lee ideal uh, in the derivation Lee algebra. Uh, and you take the maximal DG Lee ideal of those derivations that act unipotently on the cohomology. And that's the, that's the Lee model. And once you have these ingredients, well, it's, it's quite some work to still show that this gives you the correct, <laughs> correct action, but, but these are the main, main observations that you need, okay? And that's all I wanted to say about uh, the proof uh, idea. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions about that. I know I was quick here, so I'm sorry for that, but. Okay, so let's let's move on to to um, 
Uh, so, all right, so, so you can also describe these groups more concretely. Now I just define these groups in terms of sort of general algebraic group theory, but there are also quite concrete descriptions. Namely, if you take a uh, composition series for this representation, the, the homology representation, that, that is to say you take a flag of, of uh, sub-representation such that the, uh, I mean, successive quotients are simple representations. And then you just sum up those simple representations. And you know, by standard sort of, you know, Jordan Hulder type theorems, uh, the isomorphism clause of this um, uh, uh, representation will not depend on the choice of composition series, okay? So this is an invariant of the rational homotopy type of X. And it turns out that you can characterize these groups as follows. So this reductive group is the uh, group of linear automorphisms of this uh, representations that uh, and this superscript indicates that they must come from a rational self-equivalence of X or rather a self-homotopy equivalence of the rationalization of X. And similar, this gamma is the group of automorphisms of the same thing. Uh, and you look at those automorphisms that are induced by an honest self-homotopy equivalence of X. Okay. And so this holds in general, but it also simplifies um, when certain conditions hold. For instance, it often turns out, and in fact, in all the examples we consider in the paper, the, the following conditions hold. So uh, the, the homology is semi-simple to begin with. So it's equal to this associated graded. Uh, and the space X is formal. It's, it's um, I mean, it's, it's the Sullivan model is quasi-isomorphic to the homology ring as a differential graded algebra. And in this case, this reductive group is nothing but the automorphisms of the homology algebra, which is quite, you know, easy to get your hands on if you have a, you know, concrete space. So these are these groups are really, you know, are really concrete um, um, oftentimes. Um, so, but now let's move to uh, uh, examples. So, uh, yes, uh, the first example I wanted to consider is, is the following. So let's take a product of spheres, okay? Uh, the, of the same dimension, D, okay? An n-fold product. Um, then um, we prove the following. So we begin with the case when D is odd, okay? Then we get the following concrete descriptions of these groups. I mean, using the theorem that I just stated, uh, this reductive group is just the general linear group. I mean, the, I mean, you know, the basic example of a reductive <laughs> algebraic group, GLN. Um, and uh, this arithmetic subgroup, I mean, which arithmetic subgroup you get depends on the dimension. And of course, you will recognize here that these are the dimensions for which SD is an H space. So when the sphere is an H space, you can realize every, uh, uh, you know, every element of GLN Z as a as a self equivalence. I mean, um, space. When D is is not uh, one, three, or seven, then you get a certain finite index subgroup, uh, and that this finite index subgroup is uh, the following curious group. It's the group of invertible matrices where exactly one uh, you have exactly one odd entry in every row. So kind of a funny group, or, or another way to say it is that the reduction mod two is a pro permutation matrix. That's another way to say it. So this is a level two congruence subgroup. I mean, um, um, yes. Uh, and and then the Lie model turns out to be very simple in this case. Uh, the this algebraic uh, Lie model is the following. It's the it's the dual of the standard GLN representation, uh, and then you but but you put it in degree in homological degree D, and then you know it's concentrated in one degree, so it can have nothing but the trivial Lie bracket and the trivial differential. So the Lie model is very simple in this case. Uh, now this this leads to uh, the following. Then and now if you just plug in these computations in the main theorem uh, or this main corollary, we get the following. Um, and yes, so the cohomology ring of the, this classifying space of, you know, remember this was the n-fold product of the d-dimensional sphere. Uh, this is isomorphic to the cohomology of this GLN Z. And here, depending on what D is, I mean, if D is one, three or seven, you remove this sigma. That's what these colors are meant to signify. 
but in all other cases, when D is different from one, three, and seven, you put the sigma there, okay? That's what this notation means. Um, and it, it, it's, you have coefficients in just the symmetric algebra on this on the standard representation, which you put in, in cohomological degree D plus one, okay? So this is just, you know, polynomial ring in N generators and, and GLN, it acts on those generators as as uh, as, as you would in a, you know this in the standard way, and I mean those types of cohomology groups um, are 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 kind of familiar to people doing cohomology of arithmetic groups. Uh, however, these are very difficult things. I mean the cohomology of arithmetic groups is is, is um, um, you know not something you easily compute. Uh, for instance, you know even for GLNZ, you only have sort of a complete computation of, of the right-hand side here for, for low values of n, uh, I would say up for n up to three or something like that. Uh, these computations are actually very difficult. Um, but there are some interesting connections to, to things like, you know, uh, uh, automorphic forms and so on and so forth. I mean, that, you know, when, when you think about cohomology of arithmetic groups. And the, the paradigmatic example of that is, is the Aishir-Shimura isomorphism. So when for GLNZ, for when n is equal to two, it's known that how to compute the cohomology of GLNZ with coefficients in a polynomial ring. And that's what the Aishishimura isomorphism sort of tells us. Um, and it gives uh, the following. So now n is equal to two, I look at the product of two spheres. And here uh, I get um, the sum over um, 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 SK here is the space of cuspidal modular forms of weight K. For, for the subgroup in question. And here there are two subgroups. I mean, either you have uh, um, SL2Z when D is one, three or seven, or you have this finite index subgroup of things that have exactly one odd entry in each row when D is different from one, three or seven. And um, so, so you get this very interesting connection uh, to modular forms all of a sudden. Um, and this is, mediated by this comparison to the cohomology of arithmetic groups. Uh, oh, and then right, right, you, here's how to, with the degree where you should put this. Um, but to me, this suggests that, I mean, there ought to be sort of a more direct geometric construction of these characteristic classes of vibration. I mean, the left-hand side, as we discussed, give you characteristic classes of vibrations with fiber SD cross SD. And the right-hand side is modular form. So this suggests that there should be a more direct geometric construction of characteristic classes from modular forms. And this observation, I think, could be, or rather this, this request, <laughs> or whatever we want to call it, could be made for more general uh, spaces. I mean, in, in, oftentimes, I mean, the, at least parts of the cohomology of arithmetic groups is, is governed by, at least conjecturally, by, by automorphic forms. And this suggests that one should try to look, you know, for, for constructions of characteristic classes out of automorphic forms uh, more directly. So that's, I think, one of the main philosophical outcomes of, of this, this work. Um, good. Uh, so I will soon move to D even, which is very different. So before I do that, uh, if there are any questions. So there's one disappointing thing here, and, the, and that's that you know the, the modular forms when you sum them up form a ring, but that ring structure is totally irrelevant here because you see I put this thing S K is put in this degree. Uh, now D is odd, so this thing here is even, and so then I add one, and then I get something odd. So this immediately implies that the cohomology ring structure here is trivial because it's concentrated in odd degrees. Um, but but you could ask like what does the product on modular forms correspond to on the left hand side and so on and so forth. Let me just sort of throw in a, I mean, isn't that true for the eichler shimura isomorphism as well, in that it's like something in H1? It's yes, exactly, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to the even case, which is very different, and it's also interesting, but for a different reason. Um, so, um, here you get a very different group. So you, for the reductive group, you get the, the group of, uh, some people call it monomial matrices. These are just matrices, invertible matrices where exactly one entry in each row is non-zero. So the, I mean, you just have sort of generalized permutation matrices where 
the entries could be some unit, uh, but then the rest of the entries in a row are zero. And the arithmetic subgroup is then just the things where you have uh, plus or minus one at one place in each row and then zeros elsewhere. And so this is, is just a signed, you can think of this as the signed symmetric group, or, or uh, I guess this is also called the hyper octahedral group uh, by some people. Um, so this is very different. I mean, this is now a finite group. Um, the DG Lee algebra also turns out to be formal in this case. Uh, the homology is different from, from the last case. Um, and, uh, but so I will not go into the details here. So this just means that there exists uh, some graded representation V such that the Chevalier Island Bercombe already is isomorphic to just a polynomial ring on this graded representation. Okay. And now since the group is finite, if we plug in this data into the main corollary, we get this, you know, cohomology of this classifying space is isomorphic to cohomology of this uh, of gamma with coefficients in Chevalier Lindbergh cohomology. Now the group gamma is finite, so it has no higher cohomology. So all we see is the zeroth cohomology, which is the, the invariance. And so now we end up looking at this sort of ring of invariants, and now we're in the setting of classical invariant theory. So we have a polynomial ring on a certain representation of a finite group, and we want to understand the invariant subring. Um, and that is very well understood, um, and and um, and we can produce. I mean, so using the classical theory of invariant theory, you can show that this this ring is a cohen macaulay ring, and it has cruel dimension n squared, and so on and so forth. And in the paper, we also produce some explicit presentations, at least when n is equal to two in, in this case. But let, let me not, um, you know, uh, it becomes a little technical, so let, let me not bother you with that. Uh, but it's, it's kind of interesting to see how, how, how different the calculation is. And our, in, the, in the previous example, we got this thing concentrated in odd degrees. The cohomology ring structure was absolutely trivial. All the elements are nilpotent. So the curl dimension is zero. Here we get something of you know, very high curl dimension. So this is a, has a totally different ring structure. Uh, OK. Uh, yes. So, uh, so those that's no. So now we're done with the products of sphere uh, example. Um, so another example, and this and now we get to the, this, which was actually the main motivation for me in, in starting this project. Um, this idea of finding an algebraic Lie model for the space was born when I worked with Eve Madsen on, you know, certain types of diffeomorphisms of manifolds, and. Um, it would have simplified a lot of our arguments if we had that <laughs> that model back at, back in the day. This is this is almost ten years ago, but 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 we went for a different route. But now with with these algebraic Lie models, we can actually simplify lots of the work that we that we we did. So well, so we are now considering the following manifold. And for technical reasons, I want to look at the manifold with boundary. So I take the G fold connected sum of S D cross S D, and I remove the interior of some small embedded disk just to get a boundary, um, okay? Now, um, the following is an upgrade of an old theorem of uh, uh, Munson and myself. Uh, and the upgrade consists in making everything equivariant. So let me just state that for the odd, there are corresponding things for the even, but I will not state those. Um, so in this case, the reductive group is the symplectic group, uh, SP2G. Uh, and this arithmetic subgroup is again depending on whether the sphere is an H space or not. You get either, I mean, if, if, if D is 1 through 7, you get just this SP2GZ, I mean, the symplectic integral group. And then this Q, you get some finite index subgroup otherwise. Um, I, let me not get into exactly what this finite index subgroup is. Um, if you need to know later, you can ask me. Um, so, uh, in this case, uh, it also turns out that this DG Lee algebra is formal. And this we knew earlier, but the new thing is that it's formal as a representation of this algebraic group. Um, and the homology is a very interesting Lie algebra, uh, namely it's the Lie algebra of symplectic derivations on a free Lie algebra on the standard uh, SP re representation. So uh, yes, so again, so this is the graded Lie algebra of uh, positive degree derivations LVG, this is the free Lie algebra on, on, on VG. Um, and VG is the standard symplectic representation. 
And omega is this distinguished element in the free Lie algebra on that representation. Um, and yeah, I look at those derivations that annihilate this element omega. Okay. Uh, and I put those generators in degree D minus one. And uh, right, so now if we plug in this into the, the main theorem, we get the following. Um, so for D odd, and here I really need D greater than one, um, um, you get an algebra isomorphism uh, like so. So the classifier, so now here I look at boundary preserving self homotopy equivalences. Um, and um, you get that this is isomorphic to the cohomology of this integral symplectic group with coefficients in the Chevalier Alimer cohomology of this, this um, Lie algebra of symplectic derivations. Uh, now, this refines an early result of myself and Madsen um, because this is unstable. This is before letting G go to infinity. So, um, when you let G go to infinity, there's a certain vanishing result due to Borel. Which says that you know the cohomology of SP of this group with coefficients in non-trivial irreducible algebraic representations that's zero if G is large compared to the cohomological degree, and so and and the specific how large G is is given by this it should so it should be two larger than two times the cohomological degree plus four in this range you get an algebra isomorphism like so I mean that you just get a copy of the cohomology symplectic group. And then you just get the invariant part of this chevalier eilenberg cohomology. So in this stable range, the computation reduces to, 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 to just invariant theory again. And this invariant theory is very interesting. Uh, and this is essentially goes back to Konsevich when he introduced uh, graph uh, complexes. So uh, he, in fact, did, uh, Konsevich considered these types of Lie algebras for, for entirely different purposes, I think. Uh, and he considered this invariant part of the chevalier eilenberg cohomology. And it turns out to be, I mean, I will just be brief here. I mean, this chevalier eilenberg cohomology can be expressed in terms of uh, the homology of this so-called Lie graph complex that Konsevich introduced. So to every cyclic operad, you have a, a graph complex. And when you plug in the Lie operad, you, you get a certain graph complex and that's what you get here. And this also, which was shown by Konsevich, the homology of the Lie graph complex is related to the homology of outer automorphism groups or free groups. Um, so this is very surprising because automorphisms of free groups have no right to, to appear <laughs> in these you know, highly connected, high, high dimensional manifolds. So this, this was a big surprise um, when we found this. Um, right. So, uh, but so so this is but this 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 I mean is, is is an old result, but some new results that we can prove using using the the new theorems, uh, or or the followings, and I will end with this. So, uh, we can now prove similar results for highly connected odd dimensional manifolds. So um, it has long been pointed out that you know these techniques that you have. Um, for even dimensional manifolds, I mean in particular some very deep calculations of Søren Galatius and Oscar Randall Williams on the stable commodity of the diffeomorphism group. Uh, those were used as input for our results. But now with this new results that I presented today, we can get rid of the dependence on those, those results. And in particular, we can now prove new things for odd dimensional manifolds. And for, for example, we can consider the following sort of analog. Um, so we take the connected sum of SD cross SD plus one, uh, G-fold connected sum. And we remove the interior of a, a small disk just to give ourselves a boundary. And then, you know, you do the same uh, thing here. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the algebraic group is, is GLG, and this arithmetic group is just a GLGZ. And the DG Lie algebra is again formal, and the homology is again a certain derivation Lie algebra. Uh, um, and in this case, um, you get an expression like this. So I'm, I'm running out of time, so I will not I will not say more about this. But let me just head cut to the chase here. Um, uh, so okay, so we get an isomorphism of algebra like before. And my PhD student Robin Stoll has just finished a paper, which hopefully will appear in the archive soon, where he computes the stable cohomology using our results. So namely, when you pass to this some stable range, so when G is large compared to the cohomological dimension this expression splits up uh, as follows. Um, and interestingly, uh, this um, thing here 
is now related to a certain twisted graph complex. Uh, I mean, so in conservative graph complexes, you can add different types of orientation data. And uh, specifically for those who know, I mean, if you twist with the determinant representation in conservative graph complex, uh, I mean, this is what turns up here. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and this latter thing is actually expressible in terms of twisted homology of auto automorphisms of free groups. And this is uh, actually goes back to work of, of, um, of Lazarev and, and, and Sasha. Um, so, the, the, I mean, uh, at least that's where I learned about this stuff. Um, so it's twisted homology about the FN with coefficients in the determinant representation of the auto automorphism group, which is this, this composite here. Um, so, so as I said, this, this last theorem is due to my PhD student, Robin Stoland, and hopefully it will appear within a few weeks or so. Um, and um, uh, yes, that's the end of my talk. So thanks for, for listening. Yes, thank uh, Alexander for the, the very interesting talk. <clears throat> Any questions? I had one brief one. I, um, it, and this is probably more sort of showing ignorance on my part than anything, but um, is there, are the sort of graph complexes that you're seeing here of the same flavor that appear in um, the stuff that uh, um, Soren and Melody Chan, uh, Chan are, are seeing and look at the top weight cohomology of the... It, yeah, that's an interesting question. It's, it's not the same thing. Uh -huh. I think, uh, I, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I think what they're looking at is more closely re related to the graph complex associated to the commutative operad. Oh, I see. I Here see. we're looking at the Lee operad. So this is some kind of Kusul dual. I see. Uh, those things are not unrelated, but, yeah. but they're no direct, you know, expression you can write down for like the homology of one is equal to something related to the homology of the other. But I mean, you can say things. So, so it's, it's a different graph complex. Okay. And I had a, a, um, a, a very vague comment about the, um, the, the weird non-ring isomorphism that was related to the um, uh, Eichler-Shimura isomorphism. Um, there's a, a similar phenomenon in a paper of Fred Cohen's from um, the early aughts in which he's studying the cohomology of uh, SL2Z with coefficients in the co He's studying the action of SL2Z on configuration spaces of points in, uh, in an elliptic curve. Oh. Uh, and he computes the answer in terms of um, the cohomology of, uh, well, in terms of cusp spaces of cusp forms. Ah, interesting. Um, so. This must be related because, uh, I mean, if you look at, I mean, it turns if you look at d equals one here, which is actually a, this theorem is applicable yeah. to d equals one, uh, uh, then the self equivalences of the torus is weakly equivalent to the diffeomorphism group. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and actually, the, the, there is some precursor to this. I mean, so the, the, so I mean, uh, Shigeyuki Morita, for instance, has has looked at the cohomology of b of the diffeomorphism group and. And, and related it to to like uh, modular form. So it sounds like um, what you're describing is is um, uh, yeah, it should be closely related. I mean, you can express the commodity of the diffeomorphism group of the torus similarly as I mean by, by this theorem essentially. But 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 uh, but for in that case it was known earlier, namely as the commodity of of um, SL2Z uh, or GL2 SL2Z if you look at orientation preserving diffeomorphism. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. with coefficients in like polynomials in two variables. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so if you then look at like some twisted commodity groups, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, it's not surprising that you see appearance of, 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 you know, various, various modular forms there. So. Okay. But mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I should have a closer look at, at this paper. Of, of I'll, 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 I'll send it your way. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. And, and is the reason that you, you can't have d equals one, three, or seven because you've also got translates with by multiplication that should appear in the cohomology. Uh, and, and I'm not sure I understand your question. So the, there's a theorem for every odd d, and it's just that you get different uh, congruent subgroups. Oh, oh, sorry. Never mind. Yeah, okay. I'll shut up. Alexander, I, I have a short question in, re in regards to this uh, theorem. 
you were suggesting that the right hand side has a trivial multiplication. I understand why it has uh, cruel dimension zero the string, but it's still a non trivial multiplication. Like if you multiply one odd uh, uh, element with another odd element, uh, you know, it's just the square of every element is zero. But if you multiply two different odd elements, then you, would, you could get a non zero element. No, because the cohomology is concentrated in odd degrees. If you multiply two odd elements, you get into. Oh, uh, I see. Oh, okay. It's only odd degrees. I see. I thought it was yeah, generated yeah. by odd degrees. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. But, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah, but it's no, it, right. It's not just generated. It's it's like the whole thing is concentrated. Yes. Mm. I see. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah I have to run to teach, uh, and so uh, which means that pretty much. We are shutting down this room, and if I uh, say turn over, uh, say to Craig, if he doesn't mind uh, uh, hosting, then uh, I, I would uh, I would be able to go. Right. Okay. Is it okay? Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's at least from this room thank Alexander okay, for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I will have the opportunity to interrogate you at, at length. And yeah. Yes. On. Yes.